It's an important uh, part of the data set. Appraisers use lots of different information. It depends what kind of appraisal you're doing. So this isn't an appraisal course. We're just being smart developers using market statistics to guide us in our decision making. I have a question. Yes. Uh, just on the new inventory to be filled, and, and no other class or price or anything. Uh, the submarket D, for example, is one point four percent D to be filled or reaching equilibrium or E is point six percent. What is the difference between working in A, B, C, D, E? Well and so it have. So so I'm just what I was doing here by way of example, you know, this could be the entire market. But it's good to know where a sub-market fits within that overall market. And if we look at this right now, so it's interesting. If there's any market with, all right, which of these sub-markets would you want to be building in? E. Which one? I think E. E. All right, so why did you choose E? Tell me again, let's go through your map. Well, less in the space needs to be filled to reach equilibrium. All right, so you know, it's really interesting. Let's follow what Nick did and said. So submarket E, and of course, you're looking here and saying, gee, the amount of space that I need to fill is just 140,000 square feet, right? But it's really interesting. 40% of the total inventory in the market needs to be filled to reach my equilibrium inventory, which is this. Anybody else want to pick another sub-market before we go? B is in Bravo. Yeah, I would pick that. And why would you, Claudius? Well, because you've got less to, uh, uh, to sell to get to equilibrium. All right, but let's be careful. So not less in total numbers, yeah. but less as a percentage. And this is why it's important. So in fact, this market, looks to be a more dynamic market. It's absorbing more space. And gosh, all I need to do is fill 13%. I probably can build in that sub-market more successfully and lease the building out. And so while the absolute number is lowest there, there probably aren't renters there for it. Yes? Can we tell that this information, um, going back to the circle of like where we are in the recession expansion or whatnot, can we use this information to identify where that is. Yes, market. yes, absolutely. But you know, the good news is that the brokers are doing it for you. But now if you want to look at the sub-market, now you can begin to analyze it. So I take the JLL chart and you know this is my mythical city and they say where am I in the cycle? And then I'd want to see where's my sub-market. And they may probably have this data, but now you can do the analysis directly on your own. Because the best person to rely on is probably yourself when it comes to these numbers and somebody else to check your math, right? So, you know, so interesting. This is why I picked it up. Thank you, Nick, thank you, Claudia, for looking at this. So, the numbers, an absolute size is important, but it's relative change is also critical. So I'm gonna to go to the third and final chart. So, these numbers here, do they look familiar? Let's go back. Remember, I just simply took these numbers move them, okay? Remember, that was the amount of inventory in each sub-market to reach equilibrium. So I took this and I said, wait, all right, remember, that was a big number. I've got to fill that space up. And yeah, that was small, but I think I'd still rather be in this sub-market. And so now, what you want to do is you would go to the Reese data and say, all right, how much space is there in the total market? How many square feet per employee does that market occupy space with? So I'm just putting up a couple of different examples here. And so the average many years ago, 30 plus years ago, it was about 200 square feet per worker, maybe more. Offices were different. You had your four walls, you had your door, you had your corner office, and then things went to cubes. And now we saw today, it's all shared workspace, <laughs> unless you want to pay a lot of money up on the third or fourth floor, right? By the way, it's really fascinating what they've done. It's so smart. So for a small company to rent a nice office on a per square foot basis, 
it's low, but the total dollar is high. And so if you have five or six people and you have to do a five-year lease somewhere down next door, it's going to cost me, I don't know, what it would be, let's say $100,000 a year. But then it said, no, you go into his space, and he's paying three or four or five thousand a month. Your absolute cost is less, but boy, you don't have a regular office suite like you used to have, which is two or three thousand square feet. You're occupying about 200 square feet in one of those little offices. So their price per square foot is through the, well, the, the ceiling, whatever that was. That was up there, you know. Well, the, what do you count the other open spaces that you can rent the, the conference room? Uh, yeah, those, 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 oh, that's those. right. And so there, they differentiated their product. You perceive value. Yes, okay. I've got the right. If you looked at that contract, they said, oh, it's really good. And you went on their website and see, well, if you do this thing, you can get how many times you can use the office, I mean, the conference room and stuff. And so in total dollars, it makes sense. But they're paying a premium for that. But people see value. And, you know, they're doing business. And, and they're right. They're probably creating and fostering a culture that promotes the, you know, new business for everybody who's there. And I mean, I have an office. Now, our company has a office in Atlanta. That's kind of like the home base. An office in San Francisco, and then our other offices are Regis offices. Regis is another vendor. It's more traditional shared office, if you will. And so, you know, for a couple hundred bucks, we rent the mailbox, if you will, and, and I can use the conference room and whatever, but it certainly isn't the dynamic environment where I could sit and meet up with others. I go in there, I collect the mail, I have conferences, but I've yet to meet anybody in the office because it's just not that environment. So that's value they perceive, they differentiated themselves in the market. So, so what's going on here is so over time, as the markets have changed the way they build office space, the number of square feet per individual is less, right? And so let's take this 200 because the math is a whole lot easier. So uh, let's go back to submarket B. I like that because this math would be pretty simple. So 400,000 square feet, you gotta fill it so we can be in equilibrium, right? And at 2,000, at 200 square feet per worker, basically, you know, we need to find 2,000 people or you need to see if employment is growing by that tune over however many years in the marketplace. So look at that, interesting. So 2,000 people are needed, or 2,000 people in firms are needed to fill that space. And then you go to that submarket and see, well, how much has employment grown in that particular submarket? And it may be in that submarket, 10,000 people are going to have jobs next year. Well, they'll absorb that space in just a couple of months, right? Look at this, 74,000, okay. I mean, that's a lot of people, but maybe the market's big. So what this tells you is that you can see that if you occupy more space per person, well, then you need less employment growth to get to equilibrium. But now, you know, how many square feet per person do you think the average entrepreneur occupies at Axis? <laughs> I think I'm going to figure it out right here. Nine yeah. square feet. Yeah, maybe. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> right, 10 square feet or something. All right. And so this is incredible economic disruption that's taking place. But if you look at markets, and I'll show you another a chart. So obviously, look at this. The number, just by shrinking the office size by 50 square feet or the cubicle, means, boy, there better be employment growth of 150,000 to occupy all that space to get to equilibrium. That's going to take longer, right? And you may not want to deal if that's the case. And the more we works and other kinds of spaces that grow in the marketplace, the harder it's going to be. And so, you can take this example, and this is a, a chart that I pulled. I pulled all this REIS data actually uh, earlier this year. I said, well, let's look at the marketplace. This is kind of interesting. By the way, let's look at Houston. 172 million square feet occupied 146 million. It's a lot of vacancies, 14 or 15 percent. As I told you, it's like at the tipping point. It's just going to, I think there's a real issue there. 
Now, net absorption is telling you what's going on, at least in the last year, of, of the office market. And then we have under construction. And by the way, I thought it was interesting looking. I, I took this, how do you think I figured this out? The square feet per office employee. I took occupied offices. This is really large, by the way. Don't look at your office if it's empty. Occupied by the total number of employees, that's another column out here, to figure out what the average space per individual is. And so, kind of interesting, actually. Um, and uh, um, why do you think Washington and New York are the highest? Look at the space per square foot uh, uh, for each individual office employee. What would make those the highest? Come on, well, guess. The federal government, they use a lot of No, that's, that's a bad answer. Luxury? Pardon? Luxury, then one more. Okay, all right, so you're on this one part of it. Yes, and that. Okay, so in financial services, in headquarters cities like New York, offices have often been bigger. That's one thing. And the office stock is older in many of those cities. So if you look in the older cities, not a consistent pattern, uh, not really, but San Francisco is not quite as old, that you know, offices were built differently. And in cities which have newer construction, if you will, Dallas, Fort Worth, look at that, 135, if you will. Austin, Texas, 115 square feet per person. And I'm sure that's all because of high tech. And the company is Weather? Come on, who's the biggest private sector employer in Austin? Dell. Dell. Oh, Austin. Okay. All right, so they're all sitting in cubicles. cubicles or something, right? Or maybe they're sharing their spaces. Who knows there? And so, all right, so, so you, know, you can see a lot about pattern. And then you can say, see, we didn't even have to look at city. You look at this, you can begin to make assumptions about the numbers. And now, let's go back to Houston. Alrighty, Occupy stock, vacant stock, under construction. God, if we did an equilibrium analysis here, so vacant is 25 million. Now, I don't know if that's equilibrium. My guess is that's higher than equilibrium. And we're building 18.4 million square feet. All right, so now, gee, it looks like, gee, 10% of the total market more than 10% of the 172 million people is under construction. But it's not the total inventory I care about. It's what's vacant. And so 25 plus 18 is about 43 million square feet of space. And I got a different set of numbers now. And so if I look at 43 million square feet, there's just a real simple little bit of math here, because I don't do calculators as well as I used to. And so I'm just going to take 43 million. And I'm going to divide that by, eh, let's do 172. Yeah, it came up to where I thought it is. So 43 million represents 25% of the total inventory that's either vacant or under construction. Now, I don't know how much of it's been leased. Actually, I think less than half. That's a real problem, isn't it? And so now we can look at this chart. So what was my absorption last year? 3.5 million square feet. In other words, the number of leases that were signed, and this we'll call it net absorption, if you heard that term, you know, sometimes space is let, sometimes it's sublet, sometimes it isn't. And so the net absorption, which is the growth over the losses, 3.5 million, we've got 18 million under construction. Let's assume for the moment that it's all vacant. Nobody signed a lease. And in Houston, that's not surprising, right? Here we've got Vacant of 25, so 18 plus 25 is 43. Net absorption last year is 3.5 million square feet. 12, 12 years. Pardon? 12 years to... Yeah, 12 years! All right, let's say that some of it's leased. It'll be less. So the money was easy, the market at bottom, and why do you think all this was happening? Remember the circles I showed you from 2012? 13, 14, 15, and Houston was just going up to the top there because of, now you can use your answer. Oil. Oil, oil. finally, at long last. Okay. <laughs> I 
knew I could get it, right? <laughs> now, if you a lot of oil there? Yeah. All right. But no, it's not just about the oil. Because remember, look, up until last year, oil was at 100, 110 bucks a barrel. And we're fracking and other things, we're pumping it. So now, the market has crashed. We're at 40 or 50 bucks. Oh my God, who's going to occupy all that space? Houston is on the precipice, right? And so this is a great way to take the numbers and figure out what's going on. Now, we're doing kind of what I'll call a macro analysis, right, folks? But boy, oh boy, it gives you insight. And you can look at each of these markets and figure out what's going on. And you'll look at either Miami, Dade, or Broward, uh, or Palm Beach, and you'll figure out that for us too as well. Which leads me to what your major study project is going to be about. <coughs> So, all right, now, now we got the eyes open and we're looking at So, I'm going to divide you into teams. All right? We'll see what the luck of the draw is on the team. All right? And you're going to analyze the development process. And we're going to pick the sites to. Uh, we haven't quite figured out which sites they are. We'll figure that out in the next couple of days. All right? And you're going to do the analysis. You're going to give us a report and a nice presentation. Four weeks from now. That's not too far. Yes, what, Alex? Uh, were, were those ranks accurate on the page right before? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Here, let's just take a look at that. I, I saw New York caught me off guard at 64 hours a square foot compared to everything else. So that's what I was just wondering if that was like accurate. Absolutely. But you remember, the cost of building in Houston is far less. Of course, of course. And everything. And in fact, this is just the asking rent for all space, because new space in New York on the west side was related in the Hudson Yards, uh, down at the World Trade Center, 80, 90, 100 bucks a square foot for, for what class space? A. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you all know about class A, B, and C now, don't you? <laughs> okay. That's an interesting. Part of That's an interesting chart. It's, it's so really that's interesting. The evolution of uh, you know, like square deploy per square foot. There were so many like 20 years ago. You know, you needed well, so, yes, so the nature, yes, the nature of space has changed, the nature of the use of the space has changed, all those things are in play. All right, so you're going to figure out the development process. We're going to help us go through the steps. And so you're going to do a report, your team's going to figure it out, you're reporting to the investment committee, or whomever it is, uh, you know, your doctor, or he and I will be committee, as well as your fellow students, 20 or 30 pages, you know, you've got the format, we'll see single space or not, each section should have, you know, an important narrative, and I'll tell you about that. And then, I want the team to get up and present that information. You've got to make a compelling case. You all did a little elevator speech, you haven't even gotten to the discussion of your favorite developers and stuff, maybe we'll get to that next time. All right, so, how you present the information is important. And so getting the experience and exposure here is going to be very helpful. And so, yes, yeah? So that, that again, that spreadsheet, you were looking at office, but you more or less want us to analysis like that, whether we're looking at industrial or hotel, the same right. kind of analysis, so, the same kind of fundamental. So, okay. so we're going to ask that you do residential apartment, that you do office, and retail. I'm going to leave out the industrial for now. You know, it's only so much we want to get you through. And that was the office analysis. And how you do apartments, a little bit different. We'll get to that next week or two weeks now. All right, so your report is going to look like this. It's good. This is the format. Make it easy for you. And let's go through the sections. All right, so you're going to transmit it. You're going to have a cover letter that says, you know, dear sirs, you know, the ABC team is proud to present this particular report, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> and here's why. And you're going to have an executive summary. Now, how many of you have written executive memoranda in business or in school? Okay, some of you. I'm sure you all have. And so I think it's really important. You can think of life in two ways. You can be the deductive incremental kind of folks, which is good when you say, I'm going to figure out this, 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 and that, and I'm going to reach my conclusions. Or you can be the inductive, 
irrational way of doing things and say, you know, here's my conclusion, and I'm going to build the case, bing, 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 to get to where I am, and I may or may not prove that I'm right. I don't care which way you do it, but get to the executive summary, because that basically condenses, coalesces all that information. By the way, I'm the inductive, irrational guy. Irrational in a good sense of the word. In the sense of that I say, here's my thesis, here's my hypothesis, in fact. How do I prove it? Because I would drive by the site, just like Harry Styles did and John Auerbach eight or nine years ago, and say, this is the site. Let me figure it out. Now how can I put all the information together to prove that deal is going to be right? But then you have to build the case. You don't always know what's there. And sometimes you don't know what can go on a site, so you go step by step. And we're going to go step by step, or not. So you're going to do an executive summary for me, and then each of you, and I'm going to suggest, you know, you'll have a team of four or five people or whatever, however the map works out. Someone does the site analysis. I mean, you can all do each section, but you can figure out how that works. So we've talked about, you've got to look at the physical attributes, the existing conditions. Somebody's got to look at the zoning, the governmental, the regulatory context, and whether something can be done. Hopefully we're going to find a site that will give you the options. And maybe some of you will be working on the same sites. We'll see what you all come up with. Maybe it's a little bit different. And then we get to the heart of this, and you're all going to have to help on this. Do the market, the economic and demographic analysis. You can look at demand and supply, the target market, and trends. You'll do an equilibrium analysis. You'll tell me whether it makes sense. And from that, now we're not asking you to draw or design anything, but just say, what would you put on it? So if my site can fit 200 units of apartments, that's what it's going to be, and there are 1,000 square feet each. Just, that's fine. We don't need drawings. We don't need plans. You've got to come up with an idea that will encapsulate things that you do. And this is just the same as the real world. Oh, by the way, then you better measure it against everything else that's in the market. And that's why I'm going to download and we'll come up with and you'll figure out what your competitive set is. And so instead of us searching for it, I'm going to do a data dump, and you'll decide what are the right properties to compare. Yes? So it's not like we'll have a piece of land and we choose the highest and best use for it. Well, it's yeah. Like the, oh, we will. Well, this yeah. is I, thought, I thought it was resident, like you were getting something and you're saying, oh, you're doing residential. Well, what, what, what we want you to do, and so what we want you to do is look at all the different uses, and then you're going to tell us oh. why the use that you chose makes sense. Look, some sites might never be appropriate for office or residential or vice versa. But we're here trying to learn, so I want you and your team to go through that exercise. So you'll come up with a comp or comparable set. And then there are two other parts before you reach your conclusions. Tell me, you know, the SWOT analysis, I think that's always good. Set that up. You said that you're going to give us a site, right? Yeah. And if that that site already has a zoning, and I mean... You're going to have to tell us what's on that site. And it may have in-place zoning, and maybe you'll do the analysis and say, you know, we can get this changed, and here's why. Uh, okay, so we can say, we want to change the why, and... You might run your back-of-the-envelope analysis and say, it's worth changing it. I don't know. You'll have four or five people. That's a lot of manpower to figure out how to do these things, right? And that... And we just want simple. Really, simple is fine. This isn't a financial analysis course, but boy, we are going to look at numbers, and that will be the end of what we're going to work at in just a few more minutes. And so we want to look at your return on costs and your return on equity. And we'll get to that because I know that was one of our problems. And then finally, conclusions. Okay, there'll be charts and tables and other things like that. So let's do this. Sounds like a feasibility study. Yeah, that's right. But it's a, it's a development deal, right? But it's not just about the market or anything like that. Pardon? Yeah, we're going to do that next. So, I want you all to count off. It's a really sophisticated method that I'm using. One, two, three, four. So start off. Remember your number. Two. Three. Four. One. Two. Uh, wait a second, I'm going to make a little exception. One. Two. Right, because I don't want you on the same team. Three. Three. Thank you very much. Four. <coughs> one. Two. Three. Four. 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 One. Two.
transform the deal into a real project. That's pre-construction, right? Figuring out whether the numbers work, getting your cost estimating, going through the zoning and all the deal. Then you're building it. <coughs> Construction. Right? And then you manage it to the completion. So it's not exactly what the book does or doesn't say, but I want to make sure you get that sense of order of how to get the deal done. And that was the reason why I put that there. All right. And by the way, so let me just expand a little bit on that. To do all that, you've got to do your market analysis, you've got to do your site acquisition, your government approvals, your financing, you know, these are all the different parts, the disciplines, if you will. We didn't go through the disciplines themselves, but that's all part of it. At every step in the process, I think there are three ways to look at it. What are your objectives? Right? What are those objectives? Well, I don't know. What are you trying to accomplish? So two that I know you're thinking, well, gee, what can I do on that one acre? Okay, or now it's 0.85 acres. Or what can I do up the street? Better know what your objective is. So that's why I say, I look at it, okay, you know what? I know I can build a couple hundred units of housing. Where can I find the site? Not like, gee, are there sites out there so I can build the housing? It's a different way, yes? It's just like public. So over the summer, public part 1.5 acres, wherever they really want to build. So that's why I spent doing is just going out and finding the suits. Like 1.5 sections of acres, you know, a property is just for Publix. Well, oh, but that's a different thing, okay? Publix has a very well-defined footprint, a very well-defined program, but I can tell you there's no other building like the 8th Avenue residence. This has a unique building. And so when I look at development sites, when we've got our site in Seattle, we have our one in San Francisco, they all look different. I'm building the same product, but it's a different deal. And that's why we look at it as it's different. So it's a good example that you gave. But it's a different side of the same point. So after you figure out what you're trying to accomplish, you want to know who is going to be on your team. So you know when I go looking at sites in different cities, I figure out well, who's going to help me do it and get them right. Your team is very important. I hope all your teams work out well. If they don't, let me know. You're only as good as the worst person on your team, right? And then. What are your steps for doing it? So what I've done for this major study project is lay out the steps. And this is really basic development, well, 58, 78, I guess, instead of 101, right? And then I gotta go back to this, remember, I'm a numbers guy. You're gonna analyze the market. No matter what you do with the site, no matter what you do with the government zoning, no matter what you do with anything else, if the market doesn't work, and your study of the factors don't work, and your numbers don't work, then, excuse me, let me go back, then it doesn't matter. I could have the best site in the world, and if the numbers don't work, I don't care. And I've said this all before. You're going to look at all that kind of stuff. And then you're going to evaluate the site. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of push through this. You'll see this when you put it up on the blackboard, what's the better position, and what's the evaluation all that. And so you're going to come to a conclusion. And so, you know, I use this test to help refresh your thinking about what it is that you've got to work on as a developer. So it wasn't just about making numbers and things. So I do like numbers. Here, let me get through this and I want to get to that next step. You know, you're going to go to go, no go decisions. All right. So what are the major trends affecting real estate development at this time? God, there are lots of trends, right? I'm not going to leave the point here, but you know, I just kind of wrote down a few, if you will. The globalization, currency exchange, oil, thank you, Claudius, I know this is his favorite word, interest rates, population growth, energy change, all those kinds of things. There's no right or wrong answer there, Alex. Would the glass be a major trend or no? Would what? The glass shortage that I talked about earlier? No, about? that's not a trend. That's the result of something else happening. Okay. And so, and so these are large issues that cause changes, but having correlation alone isn't always causation, but these things cause change. I thought uh, politics or political... Yeah, I think you can put that up there. That's yeah. not a limited list. That's right. I'm going to look. I mean, if it makes well, sense. The availability of lending, the qualification standards, the availability well, of money. But, but, the money you know, it's, it's interesting. You could talk about financial markets and maybe, but that's more localized. I mean, if you said the change of the phases in the moon, I'd say it doesn't make any sense. But, you know, if you have a reason for that, and there's a benefit for 
thing, well, that makes a difference. And yes, so your question. talks about like how equity has been, liquid equity has been kind of dried up since the recession, and so it's still impacting. So that's all about capital flows. Yeah. That would be a good reason. If you call it capital flows, you call it something else. I'll look in yours. Don't worry. I'll figure it out. All right. All right. Next one. What types of characteristics define a market area? Oh, by the way, we had a fabulous example of how you define markets when we went to the 8th Avenue residences today, didn't we? Boy, those arms for the train just kept going up and down. And so it's not necessarily the distance, if you will. It's the travel and commute time. Do you realize? I mean, come on. You can draw these areas. Remember when Reese did say, hey, you can look not just one three-mile radius, but 10, 15, 20-minute drive times. That can change a market. And so I just wanted you to be alert to it. And of course, physical, in fact, there it is, the railroad tracks, the Los Olas River, the intracoastal, the Atlantic Ocean, right? Municipal and political boundaries, because the schools, Governments, I think I'd rather live, you know, because I do, in Palm Beach County, I'd like living in Palm Beach Gardens or Boca as opposed to maybe Lake Worth or Green Acres. What about opportunities for Todd's? For what? Todd's, uh, transit-oriented design. Well, oh, okay, so, you know, that doesn't define a market. These are issues, employment, transportation, yes, perception. Population. Yeah, of course, people. So I'm looking for broad things, because here, this is a focus of trying to help you think broadly there. Okay, let's see. Oh, this one went a little bit off the edge. Okay, a developer must control at least one or four resources, and I got it somewhere here. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. That was just that chart in the book. Come on. I mean, you got to have one of these, right? And by the way, which one do you think is the most important? Uh, wait, wait a second, wait a second. Okay, <laughs> let's have a vote. Land, land, raise your hand. You know, the asset, the property. That's okay, don't be shy. So keep it up, I'm just counting. All right, we've got three people there. Capital, that's the money. Too low, it's money. Oh boy, we've got a good vote for that. Let's go to tenants. Tenants, having a tenant? Yeah, okay. All right, knowledge, knowledge. You know, I'm a knowledge guy. You can a good product, the money will come. Yeah, you hope. But, but you know, it's so interesting. And by the way, tenants, that's important. If you've got a great Class A tenant, that's going to help get you the money because you've got good credit. Clients and tenants are kind of the same thing, right? Yeah, and Class A tenants, that's right. That's right. Occupants. Good. Okay. And so now. Which is more important. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. All right. Look, hopefully, just about all of you got that. I just want to make sure you know the difference between one product and another. Actually, okay. if you have the cash, you can buy everything else, right? And build it in the account. You know, in life, it's all a little bit complicated. You really need all of them, but it depends. Whatever your personal strength is, go with that, and hopefully you can attract the other three or four. You can or whatever. have a, a white elephant, and there's no demand for it to begin with. You stuck with it, then longer to Well, so it. if I had no demand, but I had a tenant, I don't think <coughs> Because I've got someone to occupy my deal. And if I had a net lease deal with CVS, we'll talk about that. Okay. Or if I had Target or Publix, you know, that's what Regency does up in Palm Beach. They build those Publix stores, they got it down. That's great. Okay. So now we get to the fun stuff the math. By the way, who started with the math first? I saw that. I thought that was really interesting. And you know, in a way, hey, you have to get that down. And some of you never even got there. Okay. Uh, all right. So I, I'm not going to ask you to take through, but let's just do the simple math. Now, the correct answer here, and we'll show all the correct answers right now, and we'll tell you how we got it. 185,250. How many people got that number? Some of you did. I know. I looked at it. And so here's how we got it. 5,000 times 52 is 260, right folks? Okay, good. And then from that 260, 10% of that potential gross income is for vacancies, right? 10%, you subtract that, that's right, and you get down to, I think it was 247 or something like that. You are, no, 234. 
Then you expect to generate 250 a week. Once again, 250 times 52 is another 14,000. You're up to 247,000. And then you got 25%. So, so are you with me? 5 times 52, right? And you go to the math. So, all right. So, so this is stuff we just do in our heads all the time. To, you know, let's figure out, hey, what, what's, what's my NOI? I want to figure out my NOI. Because that's what I can finance. That's what I'll capitalize. Remember when we looked at styles today with their rents, they wanted to know what the NOI was on the deal. Right? Okay, so here's the next one. All right, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm an old-fashioned guy. I got the HP12C. A lot of you got this other calculator that you know, I can't understand. But, uh, and so basically, this is your monthly rent. And you have to have put it in for your calculator if you will, or could you go look up the table that Dr. Forgy basically mentioned. So 500,000, basically 7.5%. And the key is when you put it in the calculator, 500,000 is your present value. That's the PB. Okay? 7.5% is the annual rate. That's why when you put it in, it's the, you know, divided by 12 factor there. And your calculator comes up with that. 25 years, but remember I'm looking for my monthly. You put it in the calculator times 12. Now we're up to 300 and some months. I noticed this in some of the calculators, even when I was doing it with her, I got a different answer. So I don't know if it's like the programming. It's the new monthly. It's the monthly. It's the it's monthly. Month. Right, and so you've got to make sure it's on a monthly basis. And it could be that the calculator had beginning of the period instead of end of the period. But let's see if you can figure out how to get to the right answer there. And then that's why I gave you the test back, and you've got to learn how to use the calculator. And oh, by the way, if you don't have the calculator, as I said, I'll send you the link so you can get it on Android or for Mac OS. All right, this one is, I hope, very straightforward. You take the NOI and you divide it by the debt service, because that gives you the debt service coverage ratio. Yeah, it's like exactly 1.17 something, something, something. I just rounded up the number a bit. Very straightforward. Thank you, Mr. Hurt. Okay, number nine. Number nine, we're almost there. Okay. Now, I saw a lot of different numbers in this. And, and I was just, I, I was just kind of chuckling. But, okay. All right, folks, remember, it's important. This is not just a math problem. It's, it's a, a logic, and a logical problem. And what am I asking for? What is this building's equivalent rent per year? No. Per square foot. Rent per square foot per year for its net leasable area. So it's not 600 something thousand dollars or whatever. <laughs> I mean, because you can take the $750,000, right? And then you divide it by the $42,500 and get $17.65 per square foot. Okay, and that's, that's important because, you know, this is why, by, by, yes, there. Did you say that All right, so this is, I hope, straightforward. $15 per square foot on the gross building. 15 times 50 is $750,000, right, folks? And then, on the leasable area, which is smaller, is 42,500 square feet. So when you have a smaller area, the rent per square foot goes up. And so let's take this to Axis. You know, Axis is doing the same kind of stuff. You know, they're leasing out this little thing here, and they're applying their rents. So it's important to understand. And bankers and others are going to say, hey, what, what are you really getting for rentable square foot? So, Yes. A snail and you know how to get to the house. Pardon? You keep stopping for how to get to the house. I knew I'd finally have to use this. Okay. All right. Would this have been in the office chapters? This convert, this, this is the question. No, this is just basic math. Yeah, I mean, I could put widgets or apples in front of this. <laughs> or chocolate chips, which I prefer. Okay, all right, so here's our total number, right? So then I just took the 750 and 
I divided it by 42 500. That equals 1765. You see, I took it wrong. I thought that you were telling the tenant Pardon? that you're charging 50. Well, well, so, so, so wait, therefore we didn't, we didn't, you would get less. Uh, wait, wait, you're right. Look, we can talk about it. So, what's in the lease? Who knows? And so, in New York City, my favorite example, you know how they charge for rentable area in New York City? What they do is they have something, and, and the book didn't really go into this. So you have your, your actual rentable square footage, let's say, in your office space. Then you have your common area. So let's say your office floor is 10,000 square feet. Let's assume for the moment that 10,000 is in the office, but then the whole floor has 20,000 square feet of offices. But in the middle, there's 1,000 square feet for the elevator, the stairs, and the hall. Now, I may charge you for the rentable and the common area. I'm going to charge you 11,000 square feet times whatever my rent is. doesn't matter. Now, the next tenant comes along for the other 10,000 square feet. And it is being charged 10,000 plus for the common area. The landlord has just charged for that common area twice. Yeah. Now, in, I have a, you know, it's my joke perhaps, but in New York City, they usually do from six inches outside the glass in. <laughs> I mean, you know, how you measure the depth, how you measure the thickness of the walls. Now, there are building standards, BOMA, the Building uh, uh, Office of Management Association, I forget the acronym. I mean, BOMA has a standard for office space calculation, but no one in New York City uses it. And it doesn't matter, frankly, because it's however I, as a developer, if the market lets me and there's high demand, they're going to let me write the lease, you know, for gross. I'm not going to do net. I'm going to charge as much as I can. So it's all about the deal. But right now, in our simple example, what we're really saying is that the rent, we're in effect saying, hey, we're renting out the whole building or the square footage there. But the truth is, actually, the usable square footage in this building is less because the rest is offices, I mean, excuse me, elevators, stairs, and halls. So I'm getting more per square foot of leasable area. Does that help? Okay, let's go to the next and last one. Okay. And we can get to this explanation another time. All right, so does everybody know how I got to the NOI? I will, don't worry. Okay, we're evaluating. It could have been a class D building. I don't care. I just said class C. This didn't sound good. All right. So let's just do the first part. I was trying to lead you, you know, like a, a horse to water. I couldn't make you all drink, though. Right? All right. But we'll see what we can do. Here we go. 10,000 square feet are leasable. Put that up here. That's the symbol, by the way, for square feet. You know, that little thing with a square, if you will. All right. So that, right now, all we care about is the NOI, nothing else. Now, G, in this plot problem, the rent's all the way at the bottom. Don't forget, I mean, just because I'm saying, hey, I'm leasing 10,000, it's 11. You gotta read through it. All right, so times 11 equals $110,000 a year, right? That's our gross rent. Can I ask you a question? Sure. If I were to do the other one, the front door. Is that considered the construction plus the uh, acquisition or not? Sorry. So let's stay with the operations side of the building. And right now we're looking at rent and income. And then what we have to do is look at the construction and development. So, you know, the total cost for the building, we'll get there. All right, folks, it's $110,000. Now. I didn't hear you. 90% Yes, that's right. Thank you, Carol. And so if it's 10% vacant, basically what we're saying is our stabilized occupancy is 90%. So I'm going to multiply 110 by 90%, And what does that get me? $99,000, that's right. Okay, we're getting close, aren't we? 
Now I've got to figure out what my expenses are. And the tenants don't pay it. It's a gross lease. That was a great explanation John was talking about, you know, the building about do I want to work for the leases and the retail and all that kind of stuff. And, and rent, really, rents are gross leases. Public shopping centers and other things like that are generally are net or triple net. We'll get to that one day. So, $15,000 from 99. That's pretty easy to me, at least, but I know. We just have to do the math. 84000 So, that's our NOI. All right. Now, what are the annual payments for the maximum permitted loan? And so this is the challenge here. And this is where it's not about a tricky thing, but you've got to figure out what's the important information to get that maximum loan. So there are two pieces of information that are critical for lending here. One is your debt service coverage ratio, and the other is the loan to value ratio. It's not a given that one is always more important than the other. You gotta do the calculation. So in this particular case, let's just go that. Let's see, the permanent loan available upon completion is whatever, whatever, at 135% or 1.35 the debt service coverage ratio. So I could have figured out and worked backwards and said, you know, I've gotta figure out how much I can borrow. And so it was interesting. So with a debt service coverage ratio of 1.35, let's do the math. Can I take this down, folks? All right. So let's do the debt service coverage ratio. Remember it's 84,000? We're going to divide it by 1.35. Remember, the debt service coverage ratio means that the lender wants to make sure you have 35% more in your NOI than you need for the loan payment. I don't remember what this number was actually right off the top of my head. We'll do the math. Yeah, that's going to give you your annual debt service. Well, wait a second, <coughs> Jeff. Let's just think about this. <laughs> All right, so we're going to divide 84,000, and what number do we come up with? 62,200. And 22. This is, now we get there, so that's basically my principal and interest. That's the debt service. Now you can take your handy financial calculator and punch that in, and this is, now when I want to look at the loan, I actually, what I do is I go by monthly because it compounds differently, and so I'll divide this number by 12, or I'll put it in and say, okay, what's my payment? This is my payment. So it's similar to the other problem, and now you've got the other part. So I've got seven and a half percent interest, figure that out for 10 years, and you will come up with the principal value of the size of the loan. So I, I'm just gonna do a quick calc here because I don't actually have that memorized. I'm sorry about that. Thinking about other numbers. So, yeah, that's fine. So, yeah. but, uh, you know, I, I like my HB12C, just like what Chad has here. Chad, you should figure this out for me right now. Tell me. 69. How much? 69. No, but what I want now is the total amount of the loan. Oh, So let's see, I'm going to see if Chad gets this right. Wait, but you said to divide this by 12? Uh, well, I, I like to do monthly, if you will. That, that's just kind of kind of the way that I like to look at everything. So let's see what we've got. So 62222, two, two, two. enter 12, divided, change sign. So basically, my monthly payment is $5,085. What's my interest rate? 7.5. That's right. Six, three, and then we're going to look at 10 years. That's a really short loan, folks. So what, how much, what's the size of the loan? That's right, okay. So we come up with a loan now, based upon our math, of $436,823. Wow, that's great. The bank's going to give us that much money, right? No, more. No. Yes, more? They're going to give you more money? Why? 
Well, the value ratio. Oh, okay. All right, Jeff, now you're up. Loan to value. Now, we don't know what the value of the building is, but we know what the cost is. And now, we're going to assume that the cost and the value are the same. A little bit of a trick. Cost and value often are the same. For styles, they hope the value is greater. And so in this particular case, 350000 was the acquisition, and I had a budget of 100. So my total cost or value in this deal is how much? Uh, 436 divided by 8? No, 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 no. My total cost or value in the building, this is a loan amount. That's a loan. So 100 plus 350 is equal to 450. Okay, 450,000. Is the lender going to give me $436,000 for a loan? No. No, because he's limiting it to 80%. And so all of a sudden, Nobody cares about this. And more importantly, the 450 times 0.8 is 360,000. So guess what? The debt service coverage ratio is irrelevant here. Yes. You understand why? Because even though they allowed us to, you know, get used $62,000 a year, the bank said, you know, we'll let you pay but we still won't let you borrow more than 80%. And so if we're borrowing 80%, now I'm going to take $360,000 and I'm going to use the same 7.5 and, and 10 and I'll come up with an annual payment of 51000 and change. This was a harder problem. Right? You don't get it? Um, I'm just trying to get from all right, so, so I, I, I'm going to defer, I'm not an expert on your calculator, and so what we're going to have to do is look at how you can use the calculator, and we may have to call in the good doctor at some point on how to do calculators. He's standing outside the door there, he's kind of watching. All right, so please, just, just trust me that the annual, annual, Debt service is fifty-one thousand two something. You got a question on your list? Yeah, yeah I thought just so. The so, 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 DSDR just throw us off, right? And the store, the debt service coverage just throw us off the equation. Well, Chad, hold on. All right, so look. This is not to throw you off, because a lender will in effect. Yeah, it's not meant to be a trick question, but a lender will say, "Here are my loan terms: debt service coverage of one point three five, interest rate seven and a half. It's a ten-year note." And by the way, the loan-to-value or loan-to-cost is going to be 80%. And you know, in some cases, it could be flipped. So for example, folks, if, think about this, if it turned out that the building cost us $600,000, if my acquisition was 500 and the rehab budget was 100, and I went to 600, and then he said, when we did the debt service coverage ratio, remember that was a 436 number? so. Go back to the 80%. 80% 80 of 600,000 is 480. Gosh, we could have borrowed 436,000. And so, but the lender was smart because he knew if we put more equity in the deal, he'd let us borrow more. But because they were concerned about risk, see, it depends. In this case, the loan to value or loan to cost became the limiting factor. And so that came up with my payment number of 51,000. Yes. Um, the first is the present value? No, it's not present value. It's 80% of the total value or cost. Remember, 80% is the key. And so, how do I get that? 350 plus 100 is 450. 80% of 450 is 360. I'm asking 360 is that what you're getting right now, or what you have to pay back when you get back your loan? We're only talking about right now. I'm trying to get to. So, 100 is 450, 80% of that is 360. That's the most that I'm allowed to borrow. I got that part. I'm trying to get to the 51,000. Yeah, and so with 360 as the amount that I could borrow, I put that in my calculator as my present value. I put in the other loan terms. That's how I get my 51,000. So even though the debt service coverage ratio allowed me to spend $62,000 a year, the lender really won't let us pay him more than 51. Yes, Brandon. Okay, why? When you put all that in, uh, you put the 36 year calculator and you put the 10 years, why don't you compound that monthly? Is it because you didn't say? Actually, I did the monthly. That's where the 51.2 yeah. comes from. 
I mean, either way that you do it, it will probably come out the same. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, within a few dollars. All right, and then the last was if you got this number, then you could get these numbers. Now, you understand the difference between return on cost and return on equity? Return on cost was on the total project. And so, go back to styles today. It was really interesting. They said, what are we looking at? So they were looking at an initial return on cost of six point something percent. You know, they had an $85 million project, and looking at the NOI, in fact, when I looked at the NOI on that deal, I mean, 855, so five, whatever. Let me just use the word map. Uh, I, I kind of recalled what they did. Yeah, so they had a return on cost of about 6.3%. They had an NOI of about $5 million on an $85 million budget, give or take. That was, that, that was, yes, when basically they call it untrended rents, they lease up the building and that was it, the first snapshot on the building. So what I wanted to look at was what our return on cost was. And so the cost is the whole budget of the deal, 350 plus 100. And so what I did is I said, what's my NOI? 84,000. But I must subtract my debt service from that because what money are you pocketing? It's 84,000 minus 51, which is $32,000 a year, give or take. And so 32 and change. So 32 divided by the 450 gave me a 7.2% return on cost. By the way, that's a great return on cost. When you're looking at cap and other rates that are 5%, 4%, you saw the national average is 6%. We're at 7 So, So in this deal, what you really need to do is go find equity that gets you down to the loan value to 8%. Get enough private equity, then, and at the same rate, you can somehow get that same. Well, but, you know, but we're not debating here. In fact, how much equity do we need in this deal? So this is how we figure out the next number. How much equity do we need? How much? Wait. How much did the deal cost us? Four fifty. How much is the bank willing to lend us? 360. What's the difference? 90,000 bucks. That's the equity you need in the deal. Now, so remember, this is why what the bank's going to give you is so important. So now I got 90,000. I'm going to take that same $32,000 cash flow. Could NOI less debt service equals net cash flow? It's before taxes. Don't worry about it. Wow. I'm earning 36% on my equity, which gives me the answer. This is a great deal. Assuming you know how to build it, you know the lender, your contractors are good, your market analysis is fine, the zoning all works. Yes. Does that make sense what I said? So the bank's not going to loan you more than 8%. So you've got to make up the difference. You've got to make up the difference. And you're going to find the 90000 Right. Find the 90, <clears throat> yes. OK. The okay. question relates to grading. Good job today. So the question relates to grading now. Where are these grades for this exam and the first assignment you did? Where are they going to be recorded and when? That's a great question. I'll have the answer. When I figure out finishing up, I'll figure out how to get it out. So, you know, some questions are clearly worth more than others. I haven't assigned a point or value to it. Folks, this, the point of this test was really to help you think through the issues across the angle. Folks, just give me another uh, a bit here. See this 360? Remember, the 360,000 is the amount of equity. I don't know where it's my, uh, uh, the right marker there. Uh, here it is, thank you. Okay, I don't like red. All right, so 360, basically what we did is we took and what we have here, if I remember my numbers right, I hope I get it right. Let's make sure I do. Bear with me for just another minute. We're going to take $84,000. That's our NOI. We're going to subtract our annual debt service of 451279 And that's 32721 So I was close. <coughs> so I 
invested 90,000, my equity, Chad, we're in the deal for 90,000, and we're getting 32 every year. God, I'm home free after three years. Wow, what a payback. But that was an actual project of mine. I'm sure it was. And it was his problem, but I just put it up there and made it fun for you. By the way, so some people had some issues with working the calculators, and I'm going to have to defer to you on, you know, calculator math. But I'm pretty confident my math is correct. Do we have any more questions about this? Good job. Good job. Is this going to work? Well, I just, I'm honestly confused personally on how to get to 51. I don't know. I think I'm putting All something right. wrong. Like, so I'm going to do a special case, and someone will help you figure okay. out how to do that calculator. Okay. Because if you do the math, hopefully others of you will get either 51 or 51 divided by 12, which is the monthly guess. Is this in the book anymore? Um, the problem is not in the book, but all the concepts are, because in fact, when you look at your chapters, there was a whole discussion of present value. And that actually leads to us figuring out how to do the math on the left. Okay. Thank you, folks.